Welcome to Lesson 3 in this study series on the book of Proverbs. In the first two lessons, we covered the proverbial wisdom of non-literate societies in general, and then looked more specifically at the history of development, purpose, structure, authorship, and dating of the book of Proverbs in the Old Testament. In this lesson, let's look more closely at Proverbs chapter 1. I want us to examine the purpose statement and learn more about the literary device of parental speeches used in chapters 1 to 9. Then we can read and study the father's first speech found in chapter 1, verses 8 to 19. So let's open our Bibles to the first chapter of Proverbs and begin our study. As I mentioned in Lesson 2 of this series, the first seven verses of chapter 1 compose the introduction for the entire book of Proverbs. Verse 1 is the title or superscription for the book. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. The title connects immediately to the following verses that develop the purpose of the collection. They tell us Proverbs was written for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance, for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Verse 7 completes the introduction section with a summary statement. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Verse 7. It may not be as obvious in English, but verses 1 through 6 form a single sentence. Some scholars suggest chapter 1, verse 7 should not be a part of the introduction since it obviously contains a different thought. But I believe the phrase, the fear of the Lord, is the mental compass or foundational spiritual posture for students of Israelite wisdom teaching. Verse 7 acts as an ending motto to the introduction just as its repeat in chapter 9, verse 10 helps to end the first literary unit of chapters 1 through 9. In Hebrew writing, there is a common literary technique called an inclusio, consisting of a repetition of a word, a series of words, or a phrase. An inclusio is often used by biblical writers to identify the beginning and ending of a literary unit or important thematic passage. It functions much like a picture frame in that it draws attention to what is inside the frame. An example of this exists in Philippians 1, verse 27, and in chapter 4, verse 1. Paul encourages the Philippians to stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Chapter 1, verse 27. He then outlines how the Philippians should do that in chapters 2 and 3. Paul ends his core teaching in chapter 4, verse 1, by saying, Therefore, my brothers, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord. The word therefore marks a summation of Paul's core teaching, and the phrase stand firm marks the ending of Paul's inclusio. Let me give another example quickly from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16 to 20. Here Luke wishes to describe in his Gospel the character of Jesus' beginning ministry. He does so by telling the story of Jesus entering the synagogue one Sabbath in Nazareth, his hometown. The frame for Luke's important literary unit is a list of actions made by Jesus in verses 16 and 17. There it says, Jesus stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and, unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. After Jesus reads the passage, the same actions are listed in reverse order in verse 20. There it says, He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. This triple action list before and after Jesus' reading creates the inclusio or picture frame to draw the reader's attention to the content contained within. Luke wants his readers to understand that what Jesus reads is an important characteristic of his ministry. This inclusio highlights the messianic ministry described by the prophet Isaiah in chapter 61 verses 1 and 2. There it says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me 
because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. If the reader is slow in understanding, Luke makes it more clear by recording that after Jesus sat down and everyone in the synagogue was watching him, he said, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. It is the kind of inclusio that characterizes Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The phrase, the fear of the Lord, marks the beginning of a distinct literary unit that finds its ending marker in chapter 9, verse 10. This leads scholars to conclude that chapters 1 to 9 of Proverbs was collected and shaped intentionally as a specific unit of Proverbs. I will talk more about this literary unit in the next couple of lessons to further clarify what is happening. For the moment, let me simply say that the phrase, the fear of the Lord, is a key principle that shapes, interprets, and qualifies the kind of wisdom found in chapters 1 to 9. I believe the phrase also stands as a basic conceptual theme for the entire book of Proverbs. Before we move on, let's look more closely at the word fear in this motto. The fear of the Lord means awe, reverence, honor, and great respect for the Lord. It does not mean terror, panic, anxiety, fright, dread, or alarm. It is essential to understand that honoring the Lord becomes the foundational guide for orienting life's goals, values, and even the definition of true wisdom. Let me give a practical example. What time is it? Most of us would look at a watch or our phone for the time. What would happen if we all used different sources to set the time for our watches? How could we know exactly when to go to work, organize an event, program our TV schedules, attend worship, or even cook. One of the key characteristics of the Industrial Revolution more than 200 years ago was synchronizing the workforce. Without a commonly agreed upon source for telling time, Greenwich Mean Time, the world would be very disorganized, even chaotic. Fearing the Lord is like synchronizing our watch or phone to a single source. For the book of Proverbs, God alone determines the standard for wisdom, for what is right and wrong, righteousness and wickedness, holy and profane. If we reject God, then each human is free to determine for himself what is right and wrong, good and evil. The author of Judges used this definition to characterize the time before the kings of Israel when every man did what was right in his own eyes, Judges 21-25. Israelites believe that revering or fearing the Lord and following His commands and instructions brings moral righteousness, unity, peace, community well-being, wisdom, happiness, and life blessings. Let us look at another important word in this phrase of chapter 1, verse 7. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The Hebrew word for beginning could also be translated essence chief part, or key element. Israelite teachers believed that a comprehensive knowledge of God was the only thing that put a man into right relationship with everything around him. In other words, living in peace with God is the foundational component for living in peace with everyone else around us. Looking at the entire title, purpose statement, and ending motto of chapter 1, verses 1 to 7, we find a difficulty for us today. Some of the Hebrew words included seem to overlap in meaning with their English equivalents. For example, in chapter 1, verse 6, the Hebrew word we translate as parables could also be puzzles. If it refers to puzzles or riddles, where are they in the book of Proverbs? Most likely, it refers to the only question in Proverbs that appears to me to be a puzzle. It is found in the words of Agur in chapter 30, verses 2 to 4. I also believe it could point to a puzzling absence found among the numerical sayings later in the same chapter. We shall discuss these puzzles in a later lesson. Now let us move from the introduction of Proverbs to the first speech in chapter 1, verses 8 to 19. 
Scholars note that the first nine chapters of Proverbs use a literary device of short speeches given by the father, the I in the text or speech, to his son or sons, the you in the text. This technique is cleverly designed to strengthen the family bond while giving life wisdom in the form of parental advice to their children. In addition, since teachers in Hebrew society were usually older males, these speeches doubled as lectures or lessons for their young male students. Females were not usually included in such formal studies, though the advice of Proverbs is also excellent counsel for young women today. As we study Proverbs, we are supposed to assume the role of the sons, who must listen to the father's advice and choose to embrace its values that promote personal well-being and preserve society. We would be foolish to ignore the father's instruction and follow an alternative path that undermines personal, familial, and communal well-being. In these speeches, the father most prominently upholds wisdom as the greatest prize for the son to grasp. He is to cherish it, seek it, purchase it, grasp it, wear it, memorize it, understand it, and store it in his heart as the foundation, source, and guide for life. There are obstacles to obtaining this wisdom. The father reminds his son that he will encounter many dangers and obstacles while searching for wisdom. The most talked about obstacles in these speeches are wicked companions, enticements to get rich quickly through criminal activity, the temptation to drink, and the sensual pleasures of the adulteress. The father also warns his son that right and wrong are not always easily distinguishable. Wickedness is often deceptive and cleverly disguised as something very desirous. Therefore, the son must be wise enough to discern the differences and choose the right path to avoid the hidden traps of wickedness. In his speeches, the father weaves theology into his wisdom by observing that God blesses his children who seek and obtain wisdom and that he disciplines those who wickedly neglect it. In these first nine chapters of Proverbs, wisdom is personified or appears in human, feminine form. She takes her place beside the father, also making two speeches of her own to the son. These speeches are found in chapter 1, verses 20 to 33, and chapter 8, verses 1 to 36. Some scholars think wisdom's feminine voice should be understood as the mother instructing her son. But I believe Proverbs seeks to portray wisdom as a potential life companion or wife to the father's son or later on in history, the young male student. The father invites his son to value, seek, find, pursue, and embrace her, wisdom, in order to realize or share in the blessings she offers. There exists some dispute among scholars on how many speeches the father gives to his son in the first nine chapters of Proverbs. This dispute rests on the use of the phrase, my son, or the father's encouragement to listen to and receive his instruction. Some divide the chapters into ten speeches by starting a new speech every time the phrase, my son, or an encouragement to receive instruction, is used. Let us look at some of these speech markers. Speech 2 begins at chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, saying, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, Indeed, if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Speech 3 begins at chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, saying, My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Speech 4 begins at chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, saying, Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. Speech 5 begins in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, saying, My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Turn your ear to my words of insight, that you may maintain discretion and your lips may preserve knowledge. Speech 7 begins at chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, saying, My son, 
Keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teachings as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. All these speeches begin with the phrase, My Son, and an encouragement to listen to the Father's teaching or highly value wisdom. Many scholars point out that some speeches address the Son partway through the speech and do not indicate a new speech. The clearest examples of this include twice in speech 1, chapter 1, verses 8, and then in verse 10, and three times in speech 5, chapter 5, verse 1, 7, and verse 20. However, the strongest argument for additional speeches comes in chapter 3, verse 21, chapter 4, verse 20, and chapter 6, verse 1. Scholars build arguments for seven to ten speeches with general consensus leaning towards seven. For this series, I will divide the speeches into the more traditional seven, but with a slight variation for speeches five and six. I believe the first 19 verses of chapter 6 should be included at the end of speech 5 with speech 6 beginning at chapter 6, verse 20. With this arrangement, speech 6 begins at 620 by saying, My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always on your heart. Fasten them around your neck. For me, the four examples that begin chapter 6 fit better thematically as the end of speech 5 than as an awkward beginning for speech 6. If my outline is correct, then the seven speeches of the father to his son can be outlined as follows. Speech 1 begins in chapter 1, verse 8. Speech 2 begins in chapter 2, verse 1. Speech 3 begins in chapter 3, verse 1. Speech 4 begins in chapter 4, verse 1. Speech 5 begins in chapter 5, verse 1. The oddity is speech 6 begins in chapter 6, verse 20. And speech 7, which begins in chapter 7, verse 1. Now let us quickly read the Father's first speech found in chapter 1, verses 8 to 19. Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie in wait for innocent blood. Let's ambush some harmless soul. Let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit. We will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Cast lots with us. We will all share the loot. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths, for their feet rush into evil. They are swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. Upon reading this speech, the first literary note I wish to point out is the use of the phrase, My Son. It is found three times in chapter 1, verse 8, 10, and 15. If, as some scholars suggest, the phrase indicates the beginning of a new speech, then this passage would have three different speeches. However, it is obvious that all three are contained within one coherent speech. This indicates that not all of the my son phrases mark the beginning of a new speech. Speech one's use of my son strengthens my belief that there are only seven speeches in chapters one through nine. Now let us look at the general outline of the speech. It can be broken down into the following sections. In section 1, an encouragement to listen to the father's and mother's instruction is found in chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. The next section, the compelling temptation of the sinner, is found in chapter 1, verses 10 to 14. The third section is the foolishness of the wicked way or path or life and its companions, and that's found in chapter 1, verses 15 to 18. And the final section is a summary statement found in chapter 1, verses 19. An interesting note to this speech is that the mother's teaching is also mentioned here and is added only one other time in all seven speeches of chapters 1 through 9. It's found in chapter 6, verse 20. 
This does not mean the mother's teaching is unimportant. Rather, her inclusion underscores the parental emphasis of these speeches. Proverbs seems to set this speech and its admonitions in the context of a young man who is leaving his parents' home and beginning his own way as a young adult. Their counsel to him as he leaves and begins his journey is intended to guide him safely in the way of righteousness in order to avoid the pits and snares that are hidden in the temptations of the wicked. Thus, the speech counsels the young man as he leaves his father and mother to, and to be united with his wife, as in Genesis 2, 24. The parent's admonition is to teach the young man what kind of companions he should look for and what kind of house he should eventually find himself in or build for himself. It is not surprising, then, that both wisdom and foolishness are personified as females and are found in the streets calling out to their potential companions. The young man is told to stay far away from the woman folly in her house of foolishness in chapter 5, verse 8. In his first speech, the father admonishes his son to hear and not disregard the instructions and teachings of his parents. The father is encouraging his son to highly value the body of knowledge or instruction he has received while at home. It is to be his guide in life, and if he follows it, such wisdom will become like jewelry upon his head and neck. This illustration points to two important points about wisdom. First, a young man adorned with wisdom will be more attractive to others because of how it will enhance and grace his speech, actions, and life. People are generally attracted to those who are seen as wise. Second, jewelry suggests that wisdom will bring physical, social, and familial blessings to the young man. And since the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, there will also be spiritual blessings. Generally in this speech, the father warns the son against the wickedness or wicked ways of life. The wicked are not recruiting the young man for a one-time crime, but are seducing him to a way of life. They suggest that violence against the innocent or weak brings easy riches. The wicked sound clever by promising a shortcut to wealth. They also describe a brotherhood unity promise of social acceptance among peers, and shared blessing. Such talk would be a huge temptation to a young man beginning his own journey in life. However, it is in opposition to his father's instruction, which warns against such deceptive speech. The father reminds his son that ill-gotten gain is an evil spoken of often in Proverbs. Listen to these Proverbs. Such is the end of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the lives of those who get it. Chapter 1, verse 19. Ill-gotten treasures are of no value, but righteousness delivers from death. Chapter 10, verse 2. Better is a little with righteousness than much gain with injustice. Chapter 16, verse 8. And a tyrannical ruler lacks judgment, but he who hates ill-gotten gain will enjoy a long life. Chapter 28, verse 16. The Lord detests wealth gained by wickedness, and he moved his prophets to speak against it. Listen to the words of Jeremiah and Micah. But your eyes and your heart are set only on dishonest gain, on shedding innocent blood, and on oppression and extortion. Jeremiah chapter 22, verse 17. Am I still to forget, O wicked house, your ill-gotten treasures, and the short ephah which is accursed? Micah 6, verse 10. The words of these wicked companions in chapter 1 are remarkably similar in nature to the deceptive woman in chapter 7 and the call of the foolish woman of chapter 9 in Proverbs. After describing the temptation the young man will face as he encounters wicked strangers, the father warns his son of the results of such a life or path in verses 15 to 18. Though they deceptively speak of an easy life and riches, in truth, their way of life ends in tragedy. The traps they set to capture others will instead ensnare themselves. The death they plan for their victims will instead swallow them. What looks like an exciting, clever, and wealthy lifestyle actually is a means to early ruin and destruction. The father encourages his son to avoid such a disastrous punishment. The father provides a summary for his short speech in verse 19. Such are the ways of the wicked. It is a summary statement typical of wisdom literature 
found in Job 8, verse 13, in chapter 18, verse 21, and also in the prophets, such as Isaiah 14, 26. Let me end this lesson with a few textual notes. Path or way is a central theme in the speeches of chapters 1 to 9. In fact, throughout Proverbs, path expresses a way of life. It is extremely important in Proverbs that the right path or way is chosen by the student of wisdom. Often in Proverbs, the way of the wicked and the path of the righteous are contrasted so that the young man or student may be able to accurately identify each. The deceitfulness of the wicked is that their path is often decorated with temptations difficult to pass up. Shortcuts, easy riches, and sensual pleasures adorn the path of the wicked and hide the traps. Proverbs teaches that destruction and death are the surprise and sometimes sudden end of those who follow the path of wickedness. Let me summarize. The first speech instructs the inexperienced person, not yet taught by wisdom, that life contains two paths. One is characterized by seductive words and the promise of big prizes. In reality, this way is filled with traps that bring ruin. The other path is often more difficult, filled with hard work and takes longer to realize, but is more honorable, happy, and safe. The first path tells lies, saying nothing about the dangers ahead. The second path is truthful, but less attractive or promotional, even dull-looking, yet it brings a long life of blessings and happiness. Proverbs teaches us that these two paths lay before every person in life as they leave their parents' house. Every person must choose which path they will follow. As students of the Bible, we must examine the path we are on and determine whether or not it is the one of wickedness or righteousness. We must not delay in discovering which path it is. If we are on the wrong one, we must change our course immediately so that we do not fall into the hidden traps and experience the bitter punishment of our poor choices. It is important to remember that Proverbs teaches us that the right path lies with God and His counsel. Proverbs teaches us that blessings and honor follow us when we walk His path. Death and destruction come to those who walk the path away from God. Let me end this lesson by saying to you, wake up and realize that there are two paths before you. You must choose wisely, for your life depends upon it. Until next time.